Well, Elliot, we're back again. It's been a while, my friend. Yeah, yeah, it has. It has. And I, I was thinking, do I have a good excuse to tell our listeners for the gap in time? And I just don't think we have a great excuse. I feel bad about it. Well, I mean, you know, work gets in the way. We both had, you know, family events where we had to take a little time off. So, you know, sometimes uh, the podcast uh, fell short, but we are back at it. And we've got a couple of recordings planned uh, in the near term. So we'll uh, hopefully be giving our fans some some new content to discuss. Yes, here I'll, I'll, forg- I'll forgive you if you forgive me. Done. Done. Okay. All right. Good. Oof. feel better now. Okay, good. Yep, and we got a great topic today, and I'll let our guest uh, introduce himself in a second, but we're talking about ethics and AI in healthcare. And uh, Ken, why don't you uh, do a quick introduction and maybe tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, my name's Ken Sear. I'm the Chief Architect for Data and AI at Insight. Uh, My primary role is to work with our engineers, architects, and data scientists to drive out best practices, make sure that we're aligning with our customers' needs, and especially to ensure that as we implement new AI solutions for our customers in healthcare and every industry, that we're aligning on responsible, sustainable AI. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And then, yeah, I think it is definitely a broad conversation without without a doubt. I, I I guess, you know, what I was thinking we could do is start with just a, a kind of a definition of AI um, and and really kind of hopefully talk about just some of the good things that AI is doing. I mean, I, I want to I think that the notion of ethics in AI is a very sweeping conversation, a very important one, but I don't want it to be an indictment of AI. I mean, I want to I want to first start about just sort of, hey, look, this is what it is that we're talking about. And, you know, these are all the very good things, examples of very good things that we're doing. Um, I did a bit of research, you know, before all this. So I, I have some on the top of my head, but Ken, maybe you can, you know, help us with that. But before we do that, you know, I'm wondering if you could give us your own personal story. You know, I mean, I, I as we get into this conversation, it helps sometimes for the folks that are listening to understand who's talking, where they're coming from. We've learned over time that hearing a person's journey into the technology career can be fascinating. Um, so, you know, I mean, hoping you can help us start there. Yeah, Ken, sure. start at the beginning too, because we want to know about Baskin Robbins or Foot Locker or any of that <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> oh my goodness, so let's see. Uh, I went to college for mechanical and electrical engineering, uh, specialized in nano machine design. Uh, found out as I went through my career, um, worked in, especially with the Department of Defense on uh, algorithm transcription, uh, electromagnetic spectrum analysis, uh, some really heady stuff. But I found out that I didn't enjoy it very much because it moved too slowly. So. Uh, I also found out during that time, um, I almost failed my first Comp Sci 101. <laughs> um, I had a great professor who at the very end of the course said, you can throw away all your previous work and take a gamble on your final. And I did. And I found out that I finally understood Comp Sci the night before my exam. <laughs> <Good> um, <laughs> so from there, I realized that engineers uh, don't know how to program. And so I wound up writing, writing a lot of uh, algos for engineers. And then I talked to a friend in banking who was making twice as much as I was. And I realized that algo work for bankers was even better. Uh, so I hopped sideways from engineering into algo work for FinServe. And that's where I've been ever since, focused on data analytics, algorithm p- development, pattern detection. I had that really strong background in, in complex gnarly math. Um, but what I found more and more is that it's, it's really easy to write an algo comparatively. It's really hard to write an algo, an algorithm that is really well supported, that does a really good job, that makes a really important decision and makes that a decision effectively. And we'll get into all of that. It's, it's, it's incredibly complex and the math is probably the easiest part of it. Fascinating. Okay, That's cool. Great. That's great. Ken, um, my daughter is looking for an algebra tutor. Are you available? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't go back that far back, but yeah, that's, okay. that's how I got All right. through high school. Okay. All right. Oh my gosh. All right. Yes. I'm always I always stand in awe of folks that are mathematically inclined, let alone mathematical masters. You know, I I this was the one, you know, kind of corner that I always felt myself boxed in on. So 
um, yes, we we bow to you. <laughs> Not a master at all. I work with some truly, truly smart people. Um, but one of my jobs is to take that step back, not just focus on the math, but look at the human dimension, look at where these algorithms can be used correctly, or even when they're used correctly, can still lead to bad decisions uh, and, and really help my team with that broader picture. And we're going to be talking today about healthcare. You know, I came from FinServe and that's fine, but I don't necessarily need to make rich people richer all the time. Healthcare is one of the great opportunities for us to really drive human value from algorithms. And it's really exciting to be at the forefront. Yeah, perfect. Per great segue. So maybe, you know, we can kind of dovetail then into just a kind of a quick rough description of what is AI, you know, and sure. what we mean when we say that, you know, and then talk about how we parlay that capability into goodness within mm -hmm. the, the work that's done. So when we're talking about AI, there are probably 50 different definitions. Academics have really clear definitions for things like deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science. I live more in a marketing world, so I use a really broad definition. And I say AI or artificial intelligence is using math to do jobs that are too big, too fast, or too complex for humans to do well. Think about a, something simple like image recognition. Uh, we use it all the time in manufacturing to say this is a good part, this is a bad part. You take a picture and you can tell. Well, with a human, you can obviously do that, but humans get tired just looking at things going by over and over again. Imagine looking at a thousand or ten thousand parts in a day. The algorithm, the the AI, doesn't get tired. It can look at the same image over and over again and always, you know, be good or bad. When we get to medical imagery, that gets very different, though. Uh, because that could be very nuanced. It's not just this is a good part, this is a bad part. The question is, is this cancer, is this not cancer? And there's a human life at stake if you get it right, if you get it wrong. So it gets very different. You know, if you throw away a bad part, that's, you know, 99 cents maybe from the manufacturing line, but you can't throw away a human. And that's a very different type of decision. So when we're talking about using AI, we also have to talk about the risks involved. What is the impact of a false positive? What is the impact of a false negative? What is the impact of getting it right? What is the impact of getting it wrong? What are the odds in that particular algorithm? And will those odds change over time? Is your population changing? Is it getting older? Mm -hmm. you know, is it, was this algorithm developed in one population and this one has a different uh, ethnographic mix? Right, makes, makes great sense. Yeah, and in terms of, okay, so just tell me for a second with, and, and I, think I, I think I get it, but it'd be good to talk through it. So when we yeah. talk about, okay, we have an image. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the algorithm lets us understand that this image is, you know, either good part or bad part, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is. How is it doing that, you know, from an image perspective? So where's the math behind the image? Is it measuring the distance between elements within the image? Help me, help me translate that. Like, how, how does that make sense? Sure. Well, you think of an image as a big grid of pixels, all different colors. Some are dark, some are light, some are red, some are blue, and you are pointing the camera at it and you're creating this grid of pixels and you then label this as a good part, let's say. And then you have another image, very similar, that's labeled as a bad part. And you label a few thousand of these images and you point the computer at it and say, figure it out. And what it does is it picks pixels randomly and draws lines between them and says, is this a good indicator of what's good and what's bad? It does it over and over again, thousands of generations over the course of say 15 minutes on a computer because it's just chunking through. Uh, and this is where AI really came into the fore over the last decade or so because we have enough computational power to do these really expensive, iterative, dumb processes over and over again until the AI gets smart enough. And what it does is it says, okay, this type of pixel over here and that type of pixel over here and this type of geometry is a good part. And this type of pixel over here and that one over there, then that geometry is a bad part. But it doesn't recognize what we'd recognize as a good or bad part. It's picking pixels and geometries and trying to figure out how to define what a good part and a bad part is. And it could be using something completely different from what we expect. And it's really common to get what's called a sampling error or sampling bias error. For example, if you put all your good parts on a blue background and all your bad parts on a green background, it's just going to pick a random pixel in the background and that's how it's going to pick. So you have to make sure that your, your image sets are really indicative because otherwise it's going to it's gonna pick something really random to focus on. 
and it's not going to think like a human. There's a there's a famous example out there of uh, someone taking pictures of military helicopters and, and then military jeeps and saying, which one's a helicopter, which one's a jeep? And that's great. And then someone showed it a picture of a military rifle and said, that's a helicopter, obviously. <laughs> Because it was about the dark background at a certain angle at one little spot, it was three little pixels that I had chosen to identify what a helicopter was. And it's it can be really, really simplistic if you're not careful. That okay, so helpful. Um, and I know that Bob, you know, you you know, we had a couple of conversations around computer vision at some point, where you know we talked about the proliferation of in computer vision. You know, you have. X number of, cam you know, th this abundance of cameras that are capturing data, we have now the bandwidth to take that, those images and throw them up into the cloud. And now we have this processing computer in the cloud that helps us make this notion of computer vision real. Is that, Ken, is that still an accurate way to think about it? Sure, um, you're really looking for compute at scale. The cloud is a great place to do that. Um, some places still do it on-prem if they have enough, you know, bare metal lying around. Yeah, right. <laughs> really amazing it is ken i'm interested in how the image when it it happens are i'm hearing cameras sometimes are not fast enough to always pick up the things that are needed is mm -hmm. that a scenario um you know I, i'm a bit of a true crime uh buff documentary buff and they're they're now starting to poke holes into even when crimes are committed on video and someone has a video that are camera phones or other cameras are not being able to pick up exactly what happens because they're not shooting quick enough. Is it, how, Are there similar issues in like manufacturing where that could be an issue as well? Sure, so whenever you're taking any sort of digital input, you've got, you've got a maximum bandwidth that you're taking in and part of that's in terms of the gigapixel refresh on the actual sensor. Right. And then that's how many refreshes per second you can do. And you know, cell phone cameras, especially when there's fast motion or dim lighting, you're not getting a lot of detail. Right. There are ways to algorithmically sharpen that. You can imagine if you took a photo and then it moved a little in a photo and it moved a little in a photo, you could tell the, the computer that those are the same thing, kind of map them over each other and superimpose and sharpen that up. And it can get pretty smart and you can get some good quality uh, resolution back out of a blurry image. Just again, the algorithm has been trained on a lot of photographs. You take good photographs, you blur them, and then you tell the computer how to go backwards and it, it, it will do it right most of the time. But if you're talking about most of the time and you're talking about true crime, you have to be really careful because if you take these blurry set of images and then you get a sharp face out of it, it's like, that's not actually the person's face. That right. is a computer's imagination of a face based on that set of photographs over there. And what was in those photographs? Do those photographs look like the the the, the, uh, the, the potential assailant? Do they not look like the potential assailant? Big questions there. Right. Um, but yeah, you 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 have that in, in a manufacturing environment. We use high speed cameras. We get fancier cameras that have okay. a higher capture rate because we're talking about, you know, parts. You know, we did a job uh, for a company that was making electric motors. You had to wind a whole lot of wire, go super fast and they're having problems and they were losing 30 percent of their dynamos. And that was super expensive to them. So we got a high speed camera and we put it there and we took two weeks worth of capture, labeled things again, good or bad. We had good lighting, everything else was consistent. And the algorithm was able to reduce their scrap by 30%, but we needed the big fancy camera first because it, it, was, it was just a blur. Interesting. So, oh, so let me try and connect the dots between this and you know, let's call it the ethics conversation. So sure. you know, one of the things I did before this was I went to, you know, Microsoft has a ton of resources. So I always find myself going there first. And if you go to Microsoft, if you just go to, you know, search, you go know, Microsoft AI brings you sure. up to their core page, a lot of really cool case studies. One of the case studies that helped me kind of click this together was um, one in which a, uh, let's, I, I, either a scientist or, you know, whoever the champion was in this particular project um, was trying to help the blind or seeing it, you know, it's sight impaired folks mm -hmm. through artificial intelligence. And in mm -hmm. essence, I'm I'm blind or sight impaired, but I can use my camera to take a picture of the object that's in front of me. And through AI, camera's going to tell me what it is. You know, so here's my the my glass. This is my coffee mug versus the other coffee mug that's in the room, right? So mm -hmm. that's just an example that's in the thing, but it's meant to you know kind of be broader, of course. 
And the statement that was made, you know, in the case study is that we're just now building up our, you know, our data set, right? Which in my mind is all the all the many images that surround a visually impaired person, because it, from what we're talking about, the camera or AI is not going to really be able to tell me as a blind person what I'm looking at or what I can't see unless it's got enough data, enough templates to really say this is my cup or not my cup or this is the mouse or not my mouse or whatever it is, right? So, you know, then I go back to this notion of computer vision and the fact that in time we'll get a data set for this type of solution when there are enough cameras mm -hmm. that are capturing enough images to really create enough of a data repository for AI to actually work. And so I kind of leaped to this notion where then cameras have to be everywhere. Data, you know, then we're constantly being scanned. And because of that, yes, this wonderful solution will work. But is there an ethical boundary in terms of having cameras everywhere, capturing that data? Do we get to this privacy versus, um, you know, I don't want to say convenience because it's more than convenience, you know, like th that conversation. Does that make sense? Am I maybe connecting the wrong dots or I just thought of it as a way to start the conversation? No, those are important dots and privacy is really key. Uh, if we go back a few years to Google Street View, not even AI at that point, although it has been used as a basis for a lot of AI development from Google. Um, three years ago, I believe, they started blurring faces automatically because they realized that there, it was an invasion of privacy. If you happen to be walking down the street when the Google Street View went by, then somebody could go through and identify you. And obviously with any large enough phenomenon, there are gonna be a few cases where something goes really well and a few cases where something goes really poorly. And so some people got hurt by that and Google said, we're gonna start blurring faces. But even the, the face blur is done by AI. You can't have a person go through and scrub out every face. So it's, did it recognize a face? Did it not? And there are ways to thwart that. And if you're wearing sunglasses and there's a reflection behind you, maybe it won't show up as a face. And so maybe you're still not protected. It gets, it gets very sophisticated. We are definitely in an age where the barrier to information gathering is going down on all of us. And there are organizations like GDPR in Europe and the California Consumer Privacy Act uh, out West, where they're trying to address that but we really haven't understood where the cost benefit is around this. It's that the value of data is really exploding because of these computational automated ways to extract value from that data. But who has that value? Who controls that value? Is that value in getting you to buy more product? Is that value in improving your healthcare outcomes? And what if you had to accept both at the same time, what would that be like? Right. I think that's the root of the question, right? You know, is, is how, do we, how do we balance that? It's it's going to be a conversation that we're going to continue to have literally for generations. Our, our yeah. decision making power, especially where it comes to regulation, is usually two to three generations behind because mm -hmm. the ability for our representatives in our, our dem democratic bodies to understand what AI is and the impact that it will have. Um, they haven't had that experience yet. They haven't lived that life as opposed to younger people, maybe in their 20s, who are living in an AI enriched world and really understand and are making those trade offs every day for, you know, I'm going to give you my information social platform so I can have increased social contact with my friends. And that's the cost benefit that they're working on. It's a it's a generational question. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. <clears throat> you know, it's also a question on protecting America, right? I think after 9-11, I think we saw a lot of AI in in trying to protect uh, America against bad guys, right? Mm -hmm. And being able to stop that, um, which I think for the most part, um, some Americans agree with uh, that that was a good thing. Uh, but at the same time, right, it's really an invasion of privacy because there could be reading text messages and mm -hmm. other things that shouldn't be in there. So it's really interesting on where do you draw the line, right? Do you draw the line? Because um, I have a marketing background and mm -hmm. I always think, you know, with AI, it's making marketers, um, you know, think differently about how they approach a market, right? Mm -hmm. Because now it's a bunch of data and how you filter that data and go after and try to influence, right? And it's almost like uh, getting cold called from your phone, <laughs> right? With the information because you're looking to get a new toothpaste and all of a sudden you've got nothing but new toothpaste ads, right? And so it's really interesting on, on how can that line is drawn versus influencing, you know, a company, you know, like, 
when we talked about the medical example, um, you know, in other episodes, we've talked about how AI really helps the physician or the mm-hmm. surgeon or the doctor or whoever make a decision, right? It doesn't really make that decision for them because that's that's almost too far, right? But um, when we're trying to make decisions in our own life, how is, you know, AI is starting to influence that as well. So, you know, from when you're working with customers, what kind of line are they drawing and and how do you help them make that decision? Sure. And I want to go back to where you kind of started the question, because I want to make sure that we don't have a false equivalency between protecting human lives from catastrophic uh, attack or danger and upsell. Yep. Right. Because it's about risk. Yes. And so there's going to be a different privacy line that gets drawn. So when we're talking about marketers trying to identify market demographics or what products you, they might be able to push or you know how many toothpaste ads you get, yeah, you might get annoyed. And yeah, you might not want to see anything else about toothpaste. And, and you know one odd search and all of a sudden your life is that for three weeks until they pick up on another thread that they think they can upsell you on. But the risk is low. The risk that you're going to get annoyed because you have too much toothpaste in your feed that's, for, that's a relatively low level life annoyance. And the risk right. that they're going to push the wrong toothpaste, again, low level. So if they push the right toothpaste to 50% and they get a 20% attach, that's huge for them. Yep. And the risk is relatively low. But on the other side, that risk is very, very high. And we're going to talk here about false positives and false negatives. If they have a false positive with one of these algorithms that's supposed to be identifying potential threats, that means that there's a person or maybe a group of people out there that are now at best under intense surveillance, and at worst being detained. And that is a life-changing event. And so we have to be really careful about how we use that level of intelligence. And then on the false negative side, if there's something that gets missed, some sort of decision support that could have potentially averted a disaster and it's not averted, that's another catastrophic life change for another group of people. So it's very similar in healthcare. We're talking about relative risk levels. And so, you know, Bob, you pointed out that we're talking about decision support. We're not trying to take the decision out of the hands of the clinicians. Those clinicians have a tremendous amount of lifetime knowledge. We don't want to disrupt that. We don't want to disrupt their patient conversation. We don't want to, we don't want to change the way they're giving care. But if we can, we want to improve it in a way that's natural and in a way that works with the clinicians. Now, there are some places where it can be really, really good, um, where we do AI work, say, in treatment paths, where we can say that 80% of the time, someone in this person's cohort of age and background and socioeconomic status and medical history and medication history benefits from a treatment like this 80% of the time. That's four out of five times. We can't say that's good. We can't say it's right because 20% of the time it's not necessarily helpful. And if we talk about algorithms, I mean, the gold standard would be, you know, usually an AI algorithm is 85 to 90 percent correct. That's considered really, really good. Okay. Uh, But let's let's take it all the way to 99 percent. Your doctor. This algorithm is going to be right 99 percent of the time. One percent of the time. It's not. That means one person is going to get hurt by this algorithm out of 100. What do you do? And, And we're not we're not emotionally prepared. Forget about the math. We're not emotionally prepared as individuals or as clinicians or as patients to put our lives into the hands of an algorithm. We want to, we want to trust someone. We don't want to trust math. And yep. there are a few cases where maybe the math could be better than the average clinician. But even then, we, we can't do that until we all know what those risks are and we're all ready to accept them from the patient to the clinician, to the healthcare system, to the legal system. When a doctor makes a mistake, happens sometimes. We know how to handle that. There's malpractice insurance. There's a litigation process. When an algorithm makes a mistake, nobody knows how to handle that. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're trying to get there as a society, but it's going to take time. And, uh, you know, so this is, these are great guidelines. You know, it, it, you provide a great framework in the conversation to think through it. Um, I imagine that's part of a typical engagement around AI where we, ha- we have these conversations and where we say, hey, look, before we do this, let's talk about this. Is that fair to say? I mean, do we, or do you find that the, co- you know, do you find that our clients are bringing those conversations to us? You know, do you, is, you know, it's, it's something that's interesting to me. Is it interesting to our customers right now? Um, it is, it is interesting to everyone. I mean, when we talk about healthcare, when we talk about safety, when we talk about uh, law enforcement, there are good and valid cases for AI decision support in all of them. Um, 
But until that AI is perfect, which it, excuse me, never will be, we really have to understand what the human loop looks like. And, and even backing away from those really acute risk situations, there's, there's a high risk band that's underneath that, for example, like mortgage approvals. You're trying to get a new mortgage. If you get denied by an algorithm, that changes your life. That changes your socioeconomic future. That changes your children's future. That changes your grandchildren's future. Your economic prosperity, relative economic prosperity will have an impact for three generations. You get denied from a mortgage, you need to understand why, which is where we get to explainable AI, which is part of that responsible AI area, where when an algorithm makes a decision, you need to understand why. Was, you know, your, your credit score was this, your background is this, you have 97 missed payments on this. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But it can't be a black box in, in any of these very high risk situations or even in, in the next couple of tiers. When we're not talking about human life, we're still talking about human well-being. Yeah, agree, agree. That's really interesting. Ken, I had a thought. When when you work with customers, do they come to you and say, hey, I'm looking for an AI solution? Or do they come to you and say, I have a business problem, help me solve it, and you solve it with an AI solution? Because I, I think it's an, it's an interesting dynamic how customers are looking for a solution and AI is of course a buzzword right now, mm -hmm. but um, you know, how do they approach you when they're looking to solve uh, an issue? It, it comes into three main areas. One, uh, the first two are just what you said. We would like to solve this problem with AI. All right, that's okay. one conversation to start with. The second one is um, we would like to solve this problem. Yeah. And the third one is we would like to use AI. Mm. Um, in all three of those conversations, we're trying to get to the same place, because even if a, a customer has a particular problem in mind, and maybe that's a good problem to solve, do they have the right risk tolerance to solve that problem with AI? Do they have enough data to solve that with AI? Mm. Uh, Elliot, something that I, I had kind of slid over earlier that you talked about, you know, as we're collecting more and more data, it's not just the data that's important, it's the labeling. Uh, a couple of great examples from self-driving cars, uh, they did fine until it rained and someone turned on the windshield wipers. <laughs> because they didn't know what the windshield wipers were. And all of a sudden, the cameras that were at that point mounted inside the car freaked out. Um, even later, um, driving through tunnels. It's daytime. It's nighttime. It's daytime. Freaked out. So there were there were sampling problems. Uh, my, my favorite one was car carries, you know, those big trucks that have like 12 Toyotas on them and they're going to the dealership. Yeah. When you drive by one of those in one of the early self-driving cars, it thinks there's a 12-car pileup next to you. It cannot figure out what ah. to do. Interesting. And it's just sampling. And as they go through, and that's why you, they would do this iteratively, and they'd say, oh, we found a place where we need to get more data into the system, and we need to label that as a car carrier, we need to label that as a windshield wiper, we need to label this as a tunnel to teach the algorithm how to deal with this new phenomena. We're just so used to dealing with all of these things and you know what happens when someone's parked on the side of the road or there's a brush fire or, or, or. Um, so yeah, uh, but I'm sorry, Bob, I completely lost your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, those are really cool examples. And it, it also tells you where we are in the, you know, this is really the early stages still. You know, we, we are, are yeah. we are so in our infancy of understanding AI. AI is an incredibly powerful tool. It's going to change the way we do things. Any complex phenomena, I mean, we're seeing that right now with supply chain. If there was more AI in the supply chain, maybe it would flow smoother, but right. maybe it wouldn't because the disruptions caused by COVID are so unusual in the historical record that the old data patterns pre-COVID may not apply. I mean, one of the ways I describe AI is identifying patterns in historical data and predicting how likely they are to occur in the present and future. But if there's nothing like COVID in the historical record, AI can't solve that problem. Right, that's right. Um, I have two way out questions, right? Okay. So take these for what they're worth. This is like crazy way out. Do you remember the movie iRobot? Absolutely. Will Smith, and there were the three laws of robot. Sure. You know, and I think that's actually Isaac Asimov. You it know, is. I think they, yeah, it's right. Cool. Um, but do we, are there laws to AI? I mean, should there be laws to AI? It Does that, you know, is there a parallel there? Is that kind of silly and ridiculous and we should all laugh at me? But, oh. you know, what, what do you think about that? I, I wish protecting people from AI outcomes uh, or non-desired AI outcomes is, is as easy as writing three sentences. 
Um, we, we, when we're writing AI, we're writing a whole bunch of code to put something into an algorithm to have the algorithm come out the other side and say, I think I know how to predict this phenomena. I, I think I know how to predict whether this is a good or bad part. I think I know how to predict what treatment regimen is going to be good for this patient. I think I know what this patient's diagnosis is. Um, yeah, but it's not it's not that easy. It's it's a lot of point solutions. And and Asimov was talking about general intelligence, which is decades away. The ability to to take an AI algorithm or an AI in a big enough computer and say, solve this problem. I'm not even going to tell you what the problem is. Just figure it out. You know, how to fold laundry, how to get my kids to school on time, whatever it is. Um, we are we we create narrow AI. Is this a good part? Is this a bad part? Is this a this? Is this a that? Can you can you look at this data and output that? And you change the shape of the data and it just throws up its hands and it's like, I don't know what to do anymore. Actually, it doesn't even do that. It gives you a prediction because it can't even tell when you're asking it a different question. As long as the data fits into the input slot, it will just it will just tell you what it thinks the answer is. And again, remember, AI is triggering off of things that we don't even notice a couple of pixels here and there this column whether there's an a in the second character of a person's name it could trigger on anything if you don't know how to train it carefully so creating that robust ai putting those safeguards up front understanding what that output is and then surfacing it to a user in a way that allows them to make a safe and effective decision um, it's complicated. Like I said, the math is the easy part. It's the humans. It's the inputs. It's the outputs. It's the understanding the biases in the historical record. It's the understanding the biases when a clinician is making a decision. Yeah, that that's awesome. Okay, so my my second question now now becomes silly and moot, which was um, you know like what is this thing that we think about when we talk about you know self-awareness within ai you know this idea of ai turning into something where it knows that it exists this sentient type thing which i know is crazy whack whack job type conversation but you know that what you just did helps because it frames it in a way you know that it is there's like output from input that's what ai is today it's not this, you know, general sentient being that we're at risk of creating, you know what I mean? Which I, I you know, I think is, is good to sort of parlay that, you know, just sort of piece that together for folks who are hearing all this for the first time. My, my background is in engineering. I came into AI, uh, but I, I have a sideline in evolutionary psychology because I need to understand how intelligence is going to be used because my goal is to drive a better decision. And to make sure everyone is aware of what that better decision looks like and, and an output from an algorithm is not a better decision. It's how it's absorbed. It's how it's used. So when you talk about sentience, um, the, the great philosophical question is, are we sentient? When we think about our brains, our brains are actually dozens of different little brains, all developed with very specialized roles that are all crosswired in very particular ways. And we can short circuit our own brains. I mean, if you think about things like you see a snake and you jump back. That takes maybe two tenths of a second, but you see something else and you jump back. It takes maybe three times as long because has a different path through the brain. There's a shape snake filter in our visual cortex that jams a signal into our amygdala that says jump. And our amygdala <laughs> floods us with adrenaline and we jump and we go flush and we go pale. And then we're like, oh, it's a snake. But other things get routed through our, our prefrontal cortex and we get to try to say, what is that? And we dig through our memory and we pull that up and we say, oh, that matches this shape and it's a dog or it's a whatever. And then we decide how to react. We have, we have different pathways in our brain for different types of decisions. There's ways we filter. I mean, AI neural nets are based on our primitive understanding of how our brain works. Now, neuroscience has come 50 years since we developed neural nets, but the behaviors are still very similar. Shape goes in prediction comes out, pathway gets executed. Our brains are, are messier than that. They're more complex than that. But the way we make decisions, we filter out information that we can't handle. When we go to think about COVID, how many of us felt overwhelmed during COVID? How many of us were trying to take in all this information and try to make an effective decision? And we couldn't because there was too much information. Our brains got saturated. We, we figured out maybe we can't trust all the information that we're getting. And then we just hit decision fatigue. It's just too hard to figure out how to get the mail safely. I'm just going to sit on my couch and watch TV and let the mail pile up in the front <laughs> hall, which a lot of us did because it was too hard. And that's that's just a limit of the way our brains work. 
So I, I, I make fun of AI all the time, super narrow, super goofy. You feed it something it's never seen before. Who knows what's going to come out the other side? It's, it's going to say a mailbox is a, is a toaster, right? Because it's roughly the same size and shape. Uh, but at the same time, we can overwhelm our brains. Our brains have all these different pathways. We have these instinctive reactions and we can, we can play tricks on our own brain. We can hack it for better and we can hack it for worse. Yeah, really cool. Really, really Incredible cool. stuff, Ken. Incredible. I'm pretty sure your brain has never been saturated, just by the way. <laughs> every day. Every day. I, I have two kids, so I have I'm full time. Yeah. So, <laughs> we'll I'll, I'll, I'll leave us with one more question. So, uh, Ellie and I are big sports fans. I, I don't know if you follow sports, but I am always amazed how Vegas can predict betting lines on games and stuff like that. And they must have some serious AI working on there to be able to to predict some of this stuff. And with that said, with sports betting becoming now more of a norm in many, many states making it legal, um, my guess is we're going to start seeing a lot more AI type of apps and things like that for uh, sports betting, other types of, you know, regular day life things. A any thoughts on that? So... Sports betting is one of those great places where there's a lot of data and that data is very complex and it exceeds what the human brain can reasonably take in and work with. And so it's one of those great cases where there's too much data and AI can really help solve it. it AI can figure out which of those data points are significant and how they're lined up. There are many different ways that you could transform that data, many different algorithms you could apply to that data to try to get a high quality output. But absolutely, if somebody wanted to create a nice service to optimize somebody's uh, fantasy football team, they could do that work. They could figure out how to shape the data. They could figure out what it is and they could sell it for five bucks, 10 bucks subscription service a month. And what you'd wind up with is a fantasy football arena that looks just like the stock market. Right. Because 30 years ago, 40 years ago, bankers were way ahead of on AI. They implemented it very quickly. It was an advantage. But right now, the stock market is mostly driven by algorithms trading against algorithms. All right. And so once the algorithm starts to take over and show that clear benefit, human transactions disappeared and the the floor on NASDAQ went from being a trading floor to being a nice showroom for a CNN film. Um, and all the algos are you know, in the basement down the road in one data center to make sure that they are that cable length away from the floor so no one gets a competitive advantage. And fantasy football will go the same way. Anything that's sufficiently complex and competitive will go the same way. And it's just a matter of time until all of these competitive markets are algos versus algos. Yep. Amazing. Interesting. Great way to end the session, Ken. Agreed. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been just incredibly educational for, for me and Elliot, I'm sure, as well, and our audience. So thank you so much for the time thank today. Thank you for having me. Always happy to talk about this stuff. Great. Well, we're going to have you back for sure because <laughs> we, I think we only scratch the surface on this topic. So thanks again. And for our listeners, remember, subscribe, share, promote. We'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.